Cool. And Grady, are you ready to explain uh, inner classes? No. Okay, that's okay. All right. Let's talk about enums. Oh yeah. Oh wow! It finally built. Okay, there we go. It says false. Nice. Enums. Okay. So, um, let's do a like a uh, an enum with a class example. Okay. So remember what we talked about constants, right? Private, final. Uh, we do usually public, static, final. Um, and then we're and in our constant name, we're going to make it all caps. So for now, I'm a mock developer and production modes. Okay, so developer is equal to zero. Uh, let me just an integer, and then this is uh, production. Okay. We're actually, let's, let's do robot status: disabled, enabled, uh, enabled, and then we're going to put in autonomous. Okay, just to be relevant uh, to robotics. Okay, so this is how we might do it. And because we're not really using this for the, and the key thing is these constants, we're not using them because they equal zero, one, and two. The fact that it's zero doesn't matter. It could be five, it could be six or whatever, doesn't matter. But for example, what I can say here is I can say public static, uh, public static integer uh, current status or the status is equal to, I can give it, I can give it disabled at first, so enum, class example dot disabled, right? Uh, why is it complaining? I'm actually gonna make this a little bit larger. Maybe I'll give it some more room. Okay, what really matters is I can have some logic in here that says, if status is equal to enum class example dot disabled, uh, do something because disabled. And I can do the same thing, status is equal to enum class example dot enabled, uh, do something because enabled, right? This sort of makes sense. So we don't actually care that it's equal to zero, it's equal to one, it's equal to two. We care that because this means disabled, this means enabled, and we're able to do uh, Boolean comparisons. Does that, does that sort of make sense? So I'm, I'm trying to explain the use case here. Right, exactly. And this is for other people too. And so the thing about enums is um, we can, we're able to ditch these values and we can use the enums directly. So let's go ahead and just make a good old enum. Uh, okay. Now the key difference between here and here is that instead of class, we say enum, it's a special keyword. And then in order to define the ones you want to use, just go ahead and say, put in the names and that's it. So disabled, um, disabled comma, enabled comma, and autonomous, and then because it's my last one, semicolon. Because if I want to add more, I put another comma, foo, whatever, okay? And inside my main class, I can just go ahead and do drop in replacement. And because this is an enum example, it's actually a type. So we can remove the integer now, okay? So I can replace this and it works out really well. And this is really useful too, because you can use it in functions uh, like public static, uh, public void foo, and I can have a um, enum example get passed in here, for example, a status, and I can do a different action based on status. And uh, here I can just pass in the status dot, or I can pass in enum example dot, dot autonomous will do something different or enabled or disabled. So that's really nice and useful, okay? Okay, I will go over that soon, Supra. So I think you mean, you want me to go over return types, basically. So now we have disabled, enabled, and autonomous, right? And you might have noticed in our enum class, we've also talked about being able to give the enums uh, variables as well, if we wanted to. So you can almost speak of this as disabled is a constant, it's a, it's a constant, right? But it's also an instance of enum example. So if I were to expand this out, I could say uh, public static uh, void, I, I can say that this is, uh, instead this can be public static enum class example disabled, and this is technically an instance of enum class example, right? And then uh, same goes for, let me just expand this, e, uh, enabled, right, et cetera. So these are, uh, and with an enum, uh, 
up here. These technically act like separate instances. So we can actually make it. We can actually make a constructor. For example, what if we say we do care about a number? Okay. What if we do care that this table is zero, one, and two? We can attach that to the names as well. It's like additional information, you know. So we can go and say we expect the integer. We're going to say num. Okay. Um, public uh, integer num. This dot num is equal to num. And it's just like just like you're saying new enum example, right? Except we're dishing a new enum example. We're directly putting a name and we're putting parentheses and we're gonna pass in a number that a number that we want. Right. So now, for example, this is enum disabled, right? Now I can say status, which uh dot num, and this will give me four. Okay, so enum example dot disabled dot num will give me four. Okay, so and enum dot enable dot num will give me three, because technically they're different instances, right? This is a field. This is a member variable. They're tied to the instance. All right, and really quickly, I'm gonna go over some return types as well. A bunch of methods. Okay, so super I've asked about what void meant, so I thought I might as well go over uh, return types really quickly. So the idea of a function is you tell it to do something and it produces a result, right? And it can produce a result by either doing an action or it can produce a result by giving you a value back, okay? When you want to just simply do an action, you don't care about like what kind of value it calculates and whatever, you can make a void. For example, if I wanted to make a method that just simply does one thing, it meows. Public void meow, okay? And all it does is system the out print line and it goes meow. The, the thing is, you don't really care that meow returns like a five or six or a character or a string or an object, right? All you want is to do something. You don't care about what it returns, what it gives back to you. That's when you use void. Void means the method is not going to return anything back to you. In fact, if you try to, if you try to system dot out dot print line what meow returns, you're going to get null, meaning no value. Okay, but, 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 if you say you did want to get a value back, for example, you're trying to square two numbers or you're trying to multiply two numbers together. When you multiply two numbers, you expect a number back, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and just cheat a little bit and just use number, but I can, but now I can say uh, multiply. I can say uh, number, num one, number, num two. And I can say uh, return number, num one, dot double value times num2 dot double value. Is, is this valid? Oh no. Right? So technically here, um, I'm returning a number, right? Because I, I'm, I, whoever's using this method is gonna give me two numbers. I'm gonna multiply them together and give you the multiplication back. That's why return is really important here. We can't say void. Alternatively, if you're not familiar with a number, uh, you can also go in and just use primitives. This, is, this works fine too. I was just trying to showcase that it works for classes as well. Okay. Does this make sense to you, Ralph? Return types. Void return types. All right. Cool. All right. There's um, hmm. lambdas, right? All right. You know what? I feel like it's better if we watch a video on lambdas because I have a feeling I I don't think I can talk about lambdas very efficiently. So let's just watch a video. Let me pull it up for you guys right now. Lambdas, Java. You guys are fine with watching a video right now, right? Oh, actually, you know what? Before we do lambdas, let's have let's have Grady do his inner class stuff. All right, take it away, Grady. All right, I have created an inner class. Well, and I've created its outer class too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, I'm showing you the two ways that I guess I understand inner classes to be used. We only have implement one of them in robot code, and I'll tell you which one it is. But um. So we have the outer class and it just has everything like normal. So we have a car and it has a wheel and a brand. And um, when in the constructor, 
we are. Oh, I forgot to set. And those uh, anyway. Um, so in the constructor, we create the wheel and that's an inner class. It's a tied to the instance of car. It's not tied to the, it's not static. It's not tied to the class. It's tied to the instance of car. Then that just kind of works just like its own class there. And then I created another class to demonstrate a different thing that you'll see when I go over to the main method um, that keeps track of the car's body type and color. And you can put that in later, but it doesn't come in the car's constructor. And then we also have this get wheel here, which means these can actually be private. Always encapsulate. Um, anyway, um, Anyway, so um, we have, we can make a car and put in the, then we can use car.getWheel and as we know, wheel refers to the wheel, which is a wheel. And then um, we can use, then go to the methods on there. Alternatively, we can then make a car info Oops, uh, and that would say car.new to tie it to this instance of car right there. And then you can do an info there. I We've never really used this one in robot code, but we do um, use the initializing an inner class from within the outer class. Anyway, as you might be able to imagine when I run this, It, I must not have been running what I thought I was. That's something completely different. I don't know why it cares. Anyway, I can't run it. So that's all. Thank you for the explanation. All right. Uh, does, does inner classes sort of make sense to everybody? So really the only reason why you would not the only reason why, but inner classes are really good for what you need. Uh, when a class is only really in, initiated inside its outer class, so the helper class for the outer class, you know, All right? Okay. Uh, let's see. So let me just see if I can find a short video on lambdas, because I feel like a video. Someone who's prepared a video has copious examples of how lambdas work much more than I do. So I will go ahead and pull that up for you guys. Just cause, it's just because we have a lot of time right now. It's just a review class. Oh, no, let's not. OK. Uh, wow, people can talk about lambdas for a very long time. OK. By the way, if you guys ever search of programming tutorials on YouTube, very often you're going to get some Indian, okay? But I'm not being racist. It's just that if you cannot understand their English, I'm sorry. Let's solve this problem. This is what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to pass in a behavior and then execute that behavior. Well, it kind of does. But I think there is some extra work that we're doing over here. We are not just passing in a behavior. We are passing a thing that has a behavior. You're not passing in a perform method. You're passing a greeting, which has a method, which is the perform. Wouldn't it be cool if we had just an action being passed in rather than a class that implements an action? Now here, wouldn't it be cool if we just pass that action in and then this executes the action? Well, lambdas set out to achieve just this. Lambdas lets you... Um, just to be clear on what he's talking about, it's the idea that if you previously if you wanted to uh give a function or a class like you want to tell a class okay when you do this um run my code or a code that i specify previously you had to pass in an instance of a class and then the the code will have to call it okay so lambdas are a relatively new feature so this is what he's kind of going on about create these entities which are just functions 
they are called lambda expressions, which are just functions which do not belong to a class. They're not methods of a class. They are just functions which exist in isolation. And here's the best part. Those, those functions can be treated as values. This is kind of confusing for somebody who is totally used to object-oriented programming and they haven't done functional programming. So let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean by functions as values. You know what inline values are, right? So you have, uh, let's say you have a string or a double or an integer. You can define them inline. So here is an example of a string called name being declared and assigned a value of foo. Foo is a string which I have written in line. And when this executes, it takes this inline value and assigns it to the variable name. So name contains a value, which is the string foo. This should be obvious. Similarly, 3.14 is a double value, which is assigned to pi. So we know that data acts as values in Java. You can assign it to variables. You can assign it to different types. Similarly, objects act as values in Java. You can assign an instance of an object to a variable. Now the question is, can we assign a block of code to a variable as a value? So the value is not the execution of the block of code. It is the block of code itself. The piece of code becomes a value that gets assigned to a variable and that wherever the variable goes, a piece of code goes with it. Is that possible? Can we do something like this? Have a block of code which is the value which is the steps that need to be executed right here you can have lines of java code is that possible now let's take a look at this for a minute what is the standard way in which we write a block of code in java uh, before java 8 of course well it's the method right you create a method which contains a block of code it has input arguments and it has a return right this is how you typically do it imagine if you could take a method and assign it to a variable and again, note that I'm not saying execute the method and assign the return to a variable. I'm saying assign the method itself. The method becomes a thing that gets assigned to a variable. Can you do that? Now, let's say I have this perform method. This is the one we just saw, right? We have a perform method, which is a public, returns a void, and it has system.out.print. Now, what if I were to assign this to a variable called a block of code? This is possible in Java 8 using Lambda. You can write a Lambda expression which does just this. And once you do this, you can take that variable, a block of code, and pass it around and have different other pieces of code executed, which is really exciting. So let's see how to write this Lambda expression. The code that you're looking at has a lot of extra things which you don't need. For instance, let's take a look at this public. Public makes sense when a function is a part of a class, in a method, right? You need to know if a method is a public or a private or a protected, because it makes sense in the context of a class. But if a function exists in isolation, it doesn't make sense to call it public. The function is accessible by whoever has that variable. Let's get rid of that. Next, let's look at the name. When you assign a string to a variable, what's the name that you refer that string by? It's the name of the variable. You don't have to give it another name. Similarly, when you assign this function to a variable called a block of code, the way you refer to this function is using that variable name. You're gonna use a block of code name to access the function, which means that it doesn't need this other name. So let's get rid of that too. Now the creators of the Java spec could have rested here and say, okay, this is how you create a Lambda expression, but they actually went a step further. Now you see, when you look at this code, if I were to show you this code and say, can you tell me what the return type is? You don't need to look at this void. You can actually look at the code and figure out what the return type is, right? It doesn't return anything, so it's a void. So the Java compiler is now smart enough to do just that. The Java compiler says, hey, if you're writing a Lambda expression, don't tell me what the return type is. I can look at the code and figure it out. If you have a return five over here, the compiler knows, yes, this is something that returns an integer. If you have a return hello world here, it knows this is something that returns a string. If it's an object, it knows what type it is. So the compiler will know what the return type is based on the expression itself. So turns out in Java 8, you don't have to provide the return type over here for a Lambda expression. So even that goes away. So this is what's left. Uh, Lowick, so this is the process of trying to convert, like turn perform, which is a standalone method into a block of code that you can put into a variable. So yeah, basically nothing. These are the elements that you they need the to provide function. in order to write a Lambda expression. 
So we took a function that we know, we know how to write that method, right? We started out with the perform method. So we removed all the things that we don't need to specify when that becomes a Lambda expression. You don't have to specify public for a Lambda. You don't have to specify the return type. You don't have to specify the name. So with that, what's left is this parentheses, which indicate the arguments, and then the block of code, okay? So the syntax is pretty much this for a Lambda expression, except for one small addition. The addition is you need to put this symbol over here. You need to put that between the parentheses and the block of code. If you put this, well, there you go, you've got your Lambda expression. So, uh, so look, you asked me about um, why you can't just directly say perform instead of a block of code. Uh, the reason is because if you, if you wanted to pass in a method into like a constructor or a method and then the code runs, so excuse me, uh, you run that method, uh, you always have to put it into a class. You have to put in a runnable or whatever. And that syntax is very, very verbose in Java. And Java's already known to be a very verbose language. It's a bunch of clutter. Like it, it makes the code look really messy and it ruins the flow of the code. So using lambdas lets you write more elegant code that is easier to work on, easier to understand. Okay. If you know how to write a method in Java, you now know how to write a Lambda expression in Java. You need to convert these steps in your mind till you get comfortable and after that you'll be writing these expressions directly. In order to write a Lambda expression, take a method, remove the modifiers, right? You don't need the public private, you don't need the name of the method, and you don't need the return type. Now what's left is a Lambda expression except for adding the symbol, which kind of looks like an arrow, okay? You put this between the parentheses and the curly braces. It's just a hyphen and the bracket. Lambda expression. Now this lambda expression can be assigned to a variable. You can actually do this in Java 8 and this variable contains the value which is that function. All right. There is one further shortcut that you can do if your body of the lambda expression is just one line. Here is just one line. That's system.out.print. So if that's just one line, you can actually remove the curly braces. So it just becomes this. You have the parentheses, the arrow, and then that line of code. But remember, this is only if you have just one line of code in your Lambda expression. If you have multiple lines, then you are going to need the curly braces. Okay? This is how you write Lambda expressions. All right. Uh, how, how do you guys think of that video? Uh, green check mark, X, red X. How do you guys think? All right. So hopefully that clears up a little bit of the lambdas. So basically, a lambda, you really use a lambda to shorten uh, the code and uh, make it very easy. And the keyword is easy to pass code around, right? So instead of like passing around only values, because that's what it was before Java 8, before lambda expressions were introduced, you can now really quickly and easily move code around uh, through the code. And that's what uh, makes lambdas really useful, OK? And so yeah, the whole point. Oh, sorry, Greedy. Do you want Can to I jump in? And the yeah. type of the ex lambda expression is effectively a runnable. Exactly. Yeah, it is basically effectively a runnable. And um, uh, Loic, yeah, the point of a lambda expression is instead of saving, instead of saving to a variable, what happens when the code is run? For example, when you run a method, the code is run and it returns a value, right? Whether it's null or an integer or a double. Um, but the idea of the Lambda is you save the code to a variable, right? So it's kind of like, for example, you know how you, uh, for example, let's say you write a really cool program on your computer, right? You write a really cool Java program does something really cool. So you build it into a jar file and you're like, hey, bud, I, uh, let me send this over to you and you can go ahead and run the code on your own computer. It's, it's kind of the same way. A method can take some code and it can give it to another method and then the, the method can go ahead and run that code by itself. And yeah, Omri, that's okay. You can go now. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming. So it, it's this transfer of code that makes Lambda really unique. And something that's not mentioned in this video is you can also do method expressions. Okay, uh, method expressions. So for example, do you see this, um, for example, this meow, right? Uh, this meow, for example, let's say um, I have a method here that does do uh, run a method. It's a little bit of an arbitrary method, but 
let's just assume it exists. Okay, it takes in a runnable, right, and then executes the runnable. And remember what Grady said at Lambda is basically effectively a runnable, right? Um, and so that's why a runnable is really nice to use for this. If I, I can say run a method, and I instead of using defining my lambda here, and I'm like, well, I need to make a static public stat public static void. Right there we go. Yeah, instead of defining a lambda and going here, it's not at the print line. Meow. What if I have a bunch of these all in the code? It's going to get cluttered up really quickly. So the proper way is to separate into a method, right? But you can still use lambdas. You don't have to make a runnable every single time. I can make a method reference. So here I have the meow here, right? I'm just gonna make a static. So I have a bunch of methods. I'm gonna go ahead and reference the name and I'm gonna say uh, colon colon meow. And basically I have effectively turned this method into a lambda expression and I can pass it into run a method. So hey, Samuel. I Mm -hmm. Could you rewrite that statement as a lambda so that people can see how it would be? Yeah, so uh, so these two are effectively the same thing, are effectively the same code. That wasn't my intention. Um, uh, what do you mean? The lambda where you say bunch of methods dot meow. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. And the thing is, if we wanted to run bunch of methods, meow is the traditional ways you reference the name and you say dot meow, right? But the thing is, whenever you put these parentheses That wasn't here, what I was saying either, but okay. <laughs> okay. These parentheses mean you're going to run the code either way. But when you say colon colon, you're referencing the method's code. You're no longer referencing what the method returns. So that's why you could turn this in. Wait, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Grady. What am I supposed to explain? Do you want I'm to putting it in the chat. Okay, okay. All right, bye, Samri. Thank you for coming. You're saying that run method become, oh, 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 geez. Okay. Simply yeah. uh, so that people can understand exactly what the method reference does. This is technically what what it does, right? So for example, if I say in a Lambda, okay, I'm gonna run this other method, um, I can just go ahead and condense it into this. And when I run run, meow will be directly called. And uh, Java is smart enough to notice. See, even IntelliJ is like, uh, Lambda can be replaced with method reference. And you can see it converts it into that, right? So does that make sense to everybody? Yes, no, bad. All right, let me go ahead and go back to the slides of the topics. And then if, I, if we have any more questions, we'll answer them. If not, that will be the end of today's class. All right, here you guys go. Okay, sure, Rob. You want to go over over a list? All right, I'll just go over the uh, go over the slides then. Do, 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 do. Comments, for loops. Here we go. An array list. So, uh, sure, Rob. Uh, are you familiar with arrays? Like just normal, good old arrays like this. Right. Yeah. So it has a fixed size. Um, and if you want to access the first one, you say zero, the second one, you say one, et cetera. Right. And it has some fields. It has the dot length attribute, whatever, whatever. Array list basically converts it into a object. It's un it's technically extends or implements a collection, which is like a massive library that Java gives you, but I won't go too deep into it. But basically array list, the real benefit of an array list over the other one is that you can change the size of an array list. So when you create an array list, it will initially have a size of zero. Once you start adding stuff, the array list will grow and shrink with how much it has. Okay. But otherwise, it has the exact same function as a primitive array. Okay. So array.get zero is going to give you the element at index zero, aka the first element. If you say array.size, it will give you the size of the array list, aka array.length. Right. So uh, array, array list has many methods, which you can see here that um, are very similar to a normal array, except that array list can grow and shrink. 
So you can still do, for example, if you want to traverse over it with like the for loop, you can do four integer i is equal to zero, y i is less than array list dot size i plus plus, and you just array dot get, right? Same idea. But um, because array list is an object, it, it basically get, it can give you a lot more features that a normal primitive array can give you, even more than just giving the ability to resize the array constantly. So for example, in this third line here, let me get my pointer. In this third line here, I can insert an array at a very specific index. If you wanted to do, um, if you wanted to do it, um, if you wanted to do a, um, if you wanted to do this with a normal primitive array, you will have to do like a loop, you have to save all the variables and you have to shift everything. It's a very complicated process. Here, we can just directly insert it into a specific spot, okay? And we also have remove, which removes an element for you. And again, it just saves you a bunch of time and code. It prevents you from rewriting the wheel. And Surab just asked if there can be such a thing as a final array list. Technically, you can have a final array list, but when you say final, for example, if, if, if I was here, okay, if, if I had this class here, right, and I were to make this variable a final, okay, if I said final in front of here, right, technically, I can still run add, get and one not to array list array list will change it's just that i can't reassign the variable to a new array list object it will always be stuck with the same object but i'm assuming what you're saying by final is that you cannot change any contents of the array list right and that actually goes into a different part of java called the immutable array okay there's a like there's a special um immutable array class you yeah, let's go to uh uh, Java, e uh, oh, yeah, it's an unmodifiable list. Okay. So an unmodifiable list extends list just like array list does. So you can still use in all of your code, right? As long as you use list instead of directly specifying for an array list. Except if you try to run like dot set or dot and and whatnot to an unmodifiable list, you can see here, this is, um, let me zoom in. This is how it creates it. You can create an, oh, 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 oh. You can create an unmodifiable list between collections, which is a class in Java that's built in libraries, the unmodifiable list and you pass in your array list, it will create an immutable list. And basically, if you try to say dot add or anything, it will throw an exception. So it will prevent you from changing anything inside the list. Make sense, Sivra? Cool. You guys are asking good questions. All right, do I have any more? Can you show where the code from a library goes in IntelliJ again? All right, we can do that. So in IntelliJ, when you make a Gradle project, remember, it's the, we're in modern times, we don't have to do any fancy importing or downloading stuff anymore, we can just directly use Gradle. Um, on the left, on the left side, You'll have a bunch of files in Gradle. There's some files in Gradle that you can use where you specify your library. So that's specifically in the build.gradle file, okay? And there's gonna be a bunch of jibber jabber here. For example, like what is group, version, repositories, maybe in central, blah, blah, blah. But what we, what we really care about is dependencies. They're called dependencies because you basically say, hey, my code depends on this code. Can you go get this code for me so that I don't fail? And the thing, and basically, uh, this is where you drop in uh, where your code for a library goes, right? So for example, if I if I went to this link, okay, new share, okay, this is the this is the website for Joda Time, the library that we used in last class's example. Basically, when you select, and you can get this for Googling, if you select a version, it will give you the Gradle code. They can copy, and then you can directly paste back into IntelliJ. Right, you can paste into IntelliJ, and remember, because of what Daniel said, that compiles become deprecated, change the implementation, and then boom, that's all you need to do uh, to include a to include a library into IntelliJ. Okay, does this make sense, Wendy? Does this answer your question? Okay, cool. Oh man, we're going like super rapid fire mode now. Any more questions? Going once. Any more questions? Going twice. 
All right. Thank you, Loic. Thank you for coming. Bye bye. All right. If you guys feel okay about most of these, we don't have any questions. Can you guys put like a green check mark or like a thumbs up in the participants menu? All right. Wendy seems to be fine. Okay. All right. All right. That's the that's just the end of the Java class then. I hope I answered most of your questions. Again, if you have any more questions about this, and I'm not gonna actually, I'll put a photo of these topics into Slack. So if you guys want to DM either me, Grady, or Daniel for help on these topics, feel free to do so. We're always open for questions. Otherwise, uh, this is it for today's class. You guys seem to really want a Java cheat sheet, so. After November 15th, when my second round of college are finished, I will get started working on that for you guys. And um, uh, yeah, um, tune into when we give out information about our robot class uh, or robot courses. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. You guys are free to go now. Do we come next Wednesday? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna try to get I'm gonna try to get things ready by next Wednesday, so don't worry about that. Uh, but again, information about the robot class will be posted on Slack, without a doubt, within the next week. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. <sighs> All right. That's the end of the recording. Yeah.